What did we learn against the Tulane Green Wave? I've got a little bit of a criticism sandwich coming up for you right after this. You are locked on Ole Miss. Your daily podcast on the Ole Miss Rebels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. Also, I want to let you know the Rebels play the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets Saturday at 6.30 p.m. Central. We will get to see the adjustments made after last week's game, and there are some adjustments that need to be made. You can catch every play of the Rebels hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on Channel 81 on or on the SXM app, searching Ole Miss Rebels. Hello, I am Stephen Willis, and this is the Locked On Ole Miss podcast, and I hope everybody is having a good Monday. You know, people are going to look at this game against the Green Wave Tulane and try and figure out what to take from it. And some people are going to take all negative and some people are going to take all positive. And I have worked together in this thing where this is basically a criticism sandwich. There's going to be a compliment, a critique, and a compliment. That is what's going to happen in this episode. And we're going to get to lines at the end of the episode. But the first thing we need to talk about, and really the main thing that Ole Miss fans need to take out of this game is that it ended up about where we kind of thought it would be. It might have been weird getting there, but it ended up about where we thought it would be. Here was my prediction in pregame. I predicted 38-14. to The final score was 37-20. to It kind of ended up what we thought. We wanted Ole Miss to get tested. That happened. It, It may not have happened the way we thought it would happen, but it happened the way it needed to happen. And Ole Miss ended up with a 17-point win on the road whenever you look at the keys. And I was pretty obvious, honest about how this game could get squirrely all week, and that exactly happened. And that happened on this keys that I put out. One key to the game, let Jackson Dart make plays for Ole Miss. Jackson Dart was the offensive reason why Ole Miss was successful on Saturday. Pressure to Lane Green Wave quarterback. A sack caused fumble resulting in Jared Ivey scoring a touchdown is the reason it became a 17-point spread. But if you look at the number three one, control the tempo of the game. This game was played at Tulane speed. The whole game, they did a really good job of making this sloppy. And there was several issues that came into it, whether it was overconfidence, whether it was something happening, not necessarily with the players, but it could have been with the coaches as well. But this is important to realize to me. Ole Miss did find a way to not only win this game, double the spread, okay? Ole Miss won this game by 17 points against a ranked team on the road. That should not be overlooked in this whole situation while looking at the Ole Miss two-line game. That is a major story of this game. It shows you how talented this Ole Miss football team actually is because this game was a sloppy mess the whole first half. It was, we're going to talk about it in the second segment. There was some entitled play calling. The the offensive lines kind of got whooped because Tulane put Ole Miss in predictable situations and knew exactly how they needed to attack what was going on. It made the game sloppy. Ole Miss had operation penalties. There was even a turnover when Dayton Wade slipped. It, it, It was a best case situation for Tulane going into that game. And, and the best thing that Willie Fritz could have hoped for, especially with Kai Horton, I think that's his name, the two-lane quarterback playing instead of Michael Pratt, was a little bit of lead. It was not a situation where they needed to play from behind. So they needed to make it slow, and they needed to um, have the lead for as long as possible. Ole Miss gave up explosive plays. You, you, you remember me talking last week about ha- needing to eliminate explosives. The first drive of Tulane's game, there was like a 65-yard pass. Um, There was a 40-yard touchdown pass in there. Explosive plays happened offensively. That was about half of Tulane's offense. They they ended up with slightly more than 300 yards, and most of them happened on those two explosives. So it was a sloppy, messy game. And as Ole Miss fans, we are familiar with these games. 
We all remember AJ and DK going up to Vanderbilt in, when was it, 2018, where the ball dropped out in AJ's hand. Vanderbilt beat Ole Miss. We all remember um, against Memphis in 2015, Hugh Freeze losing to that Memphis team. A game that was eerily similar to this game. We all remember Houston Nutt dropping games like that. Heck, we remember Jacksonville State, right? We remember Ed Orgeron. Well, <laughs> Ed Orgeron. I, yeah, that, that one's kind of a free space. We all remember David Cutcliffe and the Jefferson Pilot game of the week against Vanderbilt when Greg Zolman throwing for 430 yards for the Commodores. We all remember Tommy Tuberville having to struggle. Remember the SMU game where Ole Miss actually won the game, but it took a miraculous comeback against a team that was like seven years off of the death penalty. This all happened. This is a game that was situated in a way that Ole Miss loses in the past. Now, if you look at Jackson Dart, Jackson Dart talked about co to coach Weiss, and they were just like, hey, our team last year would have lost this game. And I think it says a lot about the culture and the work that we put in the offseason. These guys are really buying in. And, yeah, th this would have absolutely been a loss last season. This would have been a season wrecker last season. What ended up as a 17-point win would have been an abject disaster for this team a year ago. Now, Ole Miss still has some stuff they need to clean up. It's, it's obvious. And I'm going to tell you a couple of those things that need to happen. And they can be fixed. Because if you look around the SEC, the SEC is down. LSU's defense is a wreck. They're freaking out over a 72-10 to 10 win over Grambling over the weekend. If you look at what Alabama did, they just gave up 34 points to a decent offense in the Texas Longhorns. Nothing great, just a decent offense. Something we can replicate. Now, other than Georgia, and, and Georgia hasn't exactly looked extremely special, I think Tennessee was tied with Austin P at halftime. This was not a good week for SEC football. They might have won games like Auburn won in Cal 14 to 10, but if Cal's field goal kicker didn't miss five field goals or something like that, Auburn doesn't have a chance to win that game. If the SEC officials don't blow a fumble dead at the beginning of the game, it's a tie game. Cal deserved to win that game, but they didn't have a field goal kicker. They didn't make the plays that they needed to make. And Miami just completely boat racing Texas A&M. Arkansas, okay, kind of slept walk through a game with Kent State. Vanderbilt getting beat by Wake Forest. It's there for the taking for Ole Miss. It just is. I don't know if it'll happen, but it's there. Ole Miss has the talent for it to happen. Ole Miss has the talent, I think, to beat every team on their schedule. They just have to do it. They can't play sloppily like they did against the two-lane green wave Saturday, for sure. I mean, that just goes without saying. But if you look at these games that Ole Miss have played in the past, where it's the opponent Super Bowl, where they're jazzed up and they think they have a legitimate chance to beat Ole Miss, think of how many times you've walked out of the game disappointment, disappointed. Now, think about this game where you walk out and it's like, we, we won by 17. I feel like I did when Greg Zolman was throwing the ball over, all over the field. But we won by 17 against a ranked team on the road. And Tulane's a good football team. I told you. It is one of the most well-coached teams that Ole Miss will face, potentially Georgia. I was going to say Alabama. Alabama had like 10 or 11 penalties Saturday against Texas. Texas kind of took it to them. The key to the Alabama game, I know it's ahead. Of, we're getting our ahead of ourselves there. Ole Miss needs to jump on Alabama. They need to have a quick start against Alabama because I, I don't know if they can play catch up. But we're going to talk about that after we get done with the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, which we're going to move on to tomorrow. 
But first, I do want to let you know, now is the time for your Game Changer of the Week, brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company. Much like Jackson Dart, Athletic Brewing Company has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They made non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good. Jackson is the Game Changer of the Week because his effort to will Ole Miss to a victory on the road versus a ranked team he made a couple of unbelievable passes, including his touchdown pass to Michael Trigg, which could be pivotal for this season. Athletic Brewing Company brews over 50 styles of craft non-alcoholic beer, including IPAs, Golden, Sours, and more. They're constantly releasing limited edition experimental styles to add to their variety. That's pretty cool as well. You can find athletic in store online and at bars around the country they're the fastest growing non-alcoholic brewery in the united states so get on board you can find athletic brewing companies non-alcoholic brews at a store near you or buy online at athleticbrewingcompany.com first time customers can use code locked on and get 15 percent off your first online order that's code locked on l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewingcompany.com. It's near beer, exclusions and conditions apply. Athletic Brewing Company, fit for all times. College football season is here, and this season Locked On is kicking up our coverage with Locked On College Football Kickoff Live. Each Friday, Locked On will go live from 11 a.m. Central or 11 a.m. Eastern to 1 p.m. Eastern on every Locked On YouTube channel. It's College Football Kickoff Live. They'll cover playoff implications, the conference rivalry games, and they go in depth um, like only Locked On can do, including insight and analysis from our stable of Locked On college hosts covering their team every day. Find Locked On College Football Kickoff Live every Friday from 11 to 1 Eastern on Locked On College YouTube channel. Every one of them. You won't want to miss it, including this one. It's going up, up, up. I was on it last week. I kind of nailed the why Ole Miss will hit the over in the two-lane game, and it was pretty interesting indeed. So it should be a lot of fun. Now, all right, we told you this is going to be a compliment sandwich episode where there's going to be compliment, critique, compliment. We've reached the critique section, and the offensive line – and I'm not going to say the defensive line play because the front seven in the second half was pretty salty. Um, but the offensive line kind of got whipped early on. And I I want to see how they adapt to it. Now, Ole Miss's offense is interesting, okay? Ole Miss has a very interesting offense, indeed. And that allows – they allow – I don't know, single read type stuff. It's, it's a very RPO-centric offense. So the defense, what I think is happening, okay, this is what I believe is happening, is the defense is forcing your read so you know what's coming. If they know how what you're reading off of, they can kind of dictate what you do on an RPO. And especially when we're throwing second and third level RPOs, it might look a little bit different and you have a little bit more time to get to the quarterback. I do think Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin in this game had a little bit of entitled play calling, a little bit of almost overconfident play calling, and I'd like to see something done a little bit quicker at the line of scrimmage whenever they are going through their concepts and running their RPOs because what I noticed in the first half of that game is Tulane was basically populating the box in the run game with more people than Ole Miss had to block it. And there's going to be certain situations because the way Ole Miss goes is they might block it really weird, but it's designed to make the other team move a certain direction and create a hole. Well, what is happening is basically teams at time are playing like the Madden version of Engage 8. And whenever they move, they just have a free runner in that gap. They're not, they're not playing games. They're not biting on what Ole Miss is doing. They're kind of playing them straight up. And that is causing the running game to be stagnant. And whenever Lane Kiffin talks about needing to get teams out of a certain look, needs to throw them out of it, that, that's what he means. He needs them to commit to covering the wide receivers. But 
the reason I called it entitled play calling is basically Tulane was doing that and they were also making it, I guess, I think they knew who Ole Miss was reading at an RPO and was making sure to give a run read. It was a run read. Like it might be whoever was covering, he just go back and cover it. And um, we have everybody else to rush the line of scrimmage and the football. And Ole Miss run it calling an RPO that could be problematic. And first and 10 sometimes turned into a second and 11 or second and 10. And all of a sudden the passing situation you had Jackson Dart on his spot, and behind the sticks, this offense is going to struggle a little bit. I don't know what the fix directly is. People are going to say, oh, okay, the offensive line just got whipped, which was true. They did get beat. Um, there were some good players on the front for Tulane, but a lot of that has to do with schematically how they're set up. And I, I don't know if Ole Miss needs to do more straight drop pass sets I don't know if Ole Miss needs to run the same plays with different reads. Like if you're reading the strong safety on a second level RPO and everybody knows that you're on film doing that, maybe you can change it to the free safety or make it another side of the field type situation. Maybe, maybe another receiver becomes the primary because you're trying to change the look. So the defense isn't on so much what you're doing. If, if you do that a couple of times, if you move that around, if you self-scout who your RPO is being run off of, that is going to change the defense ability to play that aggressively because they're going to be worried about whoever they're actually supposed to be feigning covering. Um, they're not necessarily doing that. That, that. That's my opinion on that. The RPO game, is it's a very interesting thing. But essentially what is happening, and these good football coaches are doing that. Um, Clark Lee did it last year, and that showed the template for LSU, Alabama, Mississippi State, all, all of those as it went on. Basically, this is the modern college football version of forcing you to keep the ball instead of pitching it. If you're on an old 1980s-style offense going down the line. It is to force the quarterback to keep the football and make a tackle. It is, it's kind of the lesser of two evils. And I understand that that is weird with a running back like Quinshawn Judkins, but I, I think that is happening a little bit in the run game with Ole Miss. People are kind of taking advantage of the RPO system. And I think you're going to see Ole Miss's offense evolve in the future. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is like compliment, critique, compliment. This is a compliment. Jackson Dart is a dude. Jackson Dart willed this team to win on Saturday. Jackson Dart did everything you would hope that Jackson Dart would do. His pass to Michael Trigg, and hey, Michael Trigg made a big-time play. I, I am convinced that during the Alabama game, this offense is going to unlock a little bit. And Michael Trigg is – I'm. There's a reason that they have been putting up with all of this that has been going on. I think Michael Trigg is going to break out eventually. It would be interesting to say. Anyway, also, I do want to point out before we um, go on to lines, Dayton Wade had a really good day, seven catches, 106 yards, had a long of 43, including a candidate for catch of the year. Really great player. This is the third Ole Miss receiver to go over 100 yards this season. That's not bad after two games. So we'll see exactly what happens. Trey Harris got nicked up in this game, okay? After the first drive and Trey Harris getting a touchdown, um, he got nicked up, did not come back to the game. That, that led Ole Miss to a little bit of a receiving desert. Um, Dayton Wade needed to step up. Jordan Watkins kind of disappeared a little bit. I'm a little bit concerned about that. Kyron Heath was non-existent. I, I wish Ole Miss would have used the tight ends in the middle of the field as well. Um, but we'll see with when Caden Priestcorn comes back. We'll see um, as the development of Michael Trigg is a little bit higher up. Um, we'll see exactly what this offense looks like because this offense, more so than most college football offense, is really, hey, we need to get the ball to this guy. And Lane Kiffin is a genius of doing that. If you look at Ole Miss in the polls, 
the AP poll almost has um is coming in at number 17. See, they got some they got some respect for Saturday. Came in at number 19 um in the coaches poll. Ole Miss has Georgia Tech this weekend. And we're gonna do lines in just a second, but should be a whole lot of fun. I, I'm 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 having a blast. Last week was an amazing week. I thank everybody for tuning in and watching the show and all of that good stuff. But thank y'all. And our Discord server's really kicking off right now. It's kind of in the private message board section. So look for it to be to have open enrollment sometime in the next six months or so. And about the next six months or so we will have open enrollment. Um, wearing my, um, I guess you can say my military Ole Miss shirt today in honor of 9-11. I keep everybody in their thoughts of what happened that day. On 9-11, I was on Boeing Air Force Base. Um, I could see the Pentagon smoking from my wife's, I guess that's the Air Force Base. It was a dorm room. My sister was off base. It went into complete lockdown. It was, it was a mess. I stood guard duty and watch every night for about two months. Um, I'd have to work eight hours, spend all night standing watch. Um, 9-11, always going to be a pretty solemn day to me. And uh, it's a pretty solemn day to a lot of people. So just keep them in your thoughts as we prepare for the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Now, I do want to let you know that today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's America's number one sportsbook. And get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 back in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. It, pretty good. The, I watched a little bit of that earlier. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you will not want to miss. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. The Rebels play the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets Saturday at 6.30 Central. We'll get to see all the adjustments made after last week's game by Lane Kiffin, Jackson Dark, and the boys catch every play of the Rebels' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on Channel 81 or on the SXM app, searching Ole Miss Rebels. Thanks again for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, Every single day. All right. It's Monday. It is time for lines. And we're going to do this a little bit differently today. It's not going to be a lot. That The show looks fantastic today, by the way. we got, a, obviously, a new graphics package sent to us from Locked On. It is really good. It's actually fairly easy to do as well. But in this game, Ole Miss opened up at 20 and a half point favorites over the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. The over-under is at 55 and a half. It should be interesting indeed. Now, we're going to talk about the keys in this game. And Brent Key and um, Buster Faulkner, which is my compatriot, Corey Burton, co-host on SEC After Dark. His cousin is the offensive coordinator for Georgia Tech. Um, we'll talk about the keys going into this game. Now, the thing you need to remember about this game is just win the game. I've already mentioned Alabama in this show. I didn't mean to. It just happened. It's just naturally where my mind went. That is going to be a problem in this for this week in the fan base. Now, the good news is the fan base, we can do that. We can get away with that. There's no, there's no penalty for doing that. But players, if you do it too much, you can get in the player's mind as well. Georgia Tech, after losing 42 to nothing last year, they're going to come in kind of ready for blood. And also, this game has a little bit of significance in the fact that Bobby Dodd, who famously refused to play the Ole Miss Rebels in Oxford, Georgia Tech is actually going to play a game in Oxford. The game is on the SEC Network. 
It's a night game. It should be a sellout for between the 17th ranked Ole Miss Rebels and the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Ole Miss is the only SEC school with a victory over a ranked team. And they have done, the league has done absolutely terribly outside of conference. Ole Miss is one of the bellwethers in the Southeastern Conference this year. It's absolutely nuts. Anyway, let's look at the week three lines around the league. Kansas State opens up as a four and a half point favorite over the Missouri Tigers in Missouri. Um, Kansas State, good football team. Uh, they just are. K, K State actually lost to this two lane team last year and then went to the Sugar Bowl. It does not have um, their Darren Sproles wannabe running back, um, but Kansas State's good good football team as well. Missouri may have been looking ahead. They struggled with MTSU over the weekend, beat them by like four points. So I, I, I don't know if that was an overlook th- type situation or if it was just a Missouri type situation. Anyway, LSU is eight, eight and a half point favorites at Mississippi State. Mississippi State looked really good in the first half of the game, looked really awful in the second half of the game. It was able to win in overtime, was the first team to defeat a Pac-10 or Pac-12 team this season um, before it all went down with Auburn um, winning the game. And I think somebody else beat them as well. But LSU is an eight and a half point favorite over a Mississippi State team that's going to be ready to go. Both teams are struggling in the secondary right now. The problem is I don't know how much the other team can make you suffer if you are struggling the secondary in this game. Should be a really interesting one to see. South Carolina is a 28-point underdog at Georgia. Um, Honestly, that game feels like a sucker bet. This this feels like a game that Georgia wins 52-3 to for whatever reason. Alabama is 31.5-point favorites over South Florida in South Florida. Um, I got a t-shirt this past week from a company down there that made a shirt. I don't have this shirt, but it it says we want Bama and it's crossed out and it says to cover the spread. Um, so I bought, they had an Ole Miss shirts as well. So I, I, I I wanted to give them a little business. Texas A&M 31 point favorites over ULM. They got boat raced a little bit against Miami. Miami kind of Kind of looked like old Miami in a game that they had no business looking like old Miami in. Vanderbilt, a two-point favorite over UNLV. So Vandy's a favorite of the Rebels, huh? Um, This is a game that Vanderbilt absolutely has to win, just like Wake Forest was. They did not win that game. If Vanderbilt drops a game to UNLV, it is going to be Katie bar the door on this season for Clark Lee and the Vanderbilt Commodores. Tennessee is a seven and a half point favorite at Florida. The, this one makes me nervous. Joe Milton is like 13th in the SEC in passing right now. They're running the ball fairly well. The, this feels like a game that Florida could wake up and get Tennessee this weekend. Tennessee had, notoriously has problems winning in Gainesville. It, it's just an absolutely bar, bizarre thing. Sanford um, is a no line game. Auburn should handle that fairly easily. Akron is at Kentucky when, as part of Kentucky's tour of the Mid- Mid-America Conference. They're 26-point favorites. BYU is making the return trip to Arkansas. Arkansas is a 10-point, 10.5-point favorite in that game as well. And then we also talk about Georgia Tech being a 20.5-point underdog to the Ole Miss Rebels. Should be a lot of fun, indeed. And I hope everybody has a good time. Watch what's going. Football this weekend was Freaking fantastic. I had a good time indeed. So everybody that's in the Discord, I will be back in it next week. Um, I had a little bit of busyness this weekend, but you can see um, what is going on there. I'm going to take some viewer mail out of the Discord a little bit later on this week, maybe. I, I don't know yet. It depends on um, how our interviews go. The, the big name interview is getting set up right now for Thursday night. I will let you know as it gets closer, and it should be a lot of fun indeed. Anyway, thanks again for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. All right, Ole Miss, a 37-20 to victory over the Tulane Green Wave. We turn our attention to Georgia Tech starting tomorrow with keys to the Yellow Jackets. Anyway. 
Till then, hotty toddy. 